Welcome to the last sessions of this year's conference. I'm Adam Stanier from the Biodynamics Association, General Manager. We have four short presentations and there'll be questions at the end. As in the other sessions, could I ask you to put your questions um, in the Q&A section through the, through the presentations and we'll try and field them at the end. So welcome to our workshop, the title Science Biodynamics, regenerative agriculture. Each of those words carries many, many ideas behind it. Science being used in very different and common phrases at the moment. The demand for absolute proof, follow the science or challenge the science. All these different phrases hide the different expectations people bring to that concept. Today, we have four experienced biodynamic practitioners, all of different paths to biodynamics, and they look forward to sharing their work and results with you. Bryony. Thank you, Adam. And um, hello, everybody. My name is Bryony Young, and I'm a biodynamic prep maker and farmer in the UK and India. Um, I think I'll just dive straight in and... Um, I look forward to answering your questions uh, later on. In 1924, the visionary Rudolf Steiner gave a series of eight agricultural lectures in response to repeated requests from farmers who even a hundred years ago had noticed a reduction in seed vigor and marked deterioration in plant and animal health. They wanted to know why. Steiner explained that the earth was exhausted, exhausted not only because we're taking out more than we put in, but also because the earth is losing forces. To describe the nature of forces, he used the analogy of the compass. You don't look into the mechanism of the compass to find out why the needle points north. It points north due to magnetic forces from the far distant cosmos working in on the earth. To address the farmer's concerns, Steiner gave practical indications for what are now known as the biodynamic preparations and insisted that we keep our work within the living realm. He said the preparations had the capacity to heal the earth and improve the nutritional quality of her produce. They're made using substances from the mineral, plant and animal kingdoms, as well as embracing cosmic rhythms. Just one example of this is the BD horn manure prep. For this prep, Fresh cow dung is put into cow horns and buried in the autumn to absorb the crystallizing or formative forces over the winter months, when these forces are strongest in the earth. We can't see these forces, but we can see the effects that they have on matter, as seen in this case with the precise crystalline structure of snow and ice. To support good health, good soil health and plant health, a small amount of mature horn manure prep is stirred in water in a very specific way before being sprayed out onto the land. Nobody knows how these preparations work, but there is a growing body of evidence to show that they do actually foster health and vitality in living systems, and I hope to shed some light on this. Various image forming methods have been developed to explore how forces and vitality may be revealed. The methodology is scientifically rigorous, but instead of analyzing quantitative stats and graphs, pictures are compared. These two are chromatography, which works in a similar way to ink moving across blotting paper. And these are the copper chloride crystallization method. Here, the two 
pictures are both patterns formed by a drop of mineral salts, i.e. a non-living substance. You can see here that as soon as a substance from the living realm is added, in this case grape juice, that the patterns become livelier and much more complex. And here we have a picture formed with a drop of conventionally grown wine. And here is biodynamic wine produced from the same variety of grapes in the same region. The crystal lattice from the biodynamic wine is much more finely branched and shows greater complexity. In a more conventionally scientific sphere, Michel Lorenzetti, Carlo Noro et al. have recently completed research in Italy that explores the role of horns and their effect on microbiology in the making of the horn manure prep mentioned earlier. Samplings are taken at intervals during the maturation process, then analyzed using DNA sequencing and metabarcoding technologies to identify the bacterial and fungal communities present in each sampling. This graph shows the first 20 most abundant fungal taxa identified in each sampling. Each color represents a different fungi. The size of each color bar indicates its proportion of the whole. Horns, as seen here, are made of the protein keratin, the same substance as our own hair, nails, and skin. But what is lesser known is that keratin is also found in the gut mucosa over the entire gastrointestinal tract. Little wonder that 40 to 50% of the fungi found in fresh cow dung is onigenales, which specifically feed on keratin. Horns, dung, onigenales. Suddenly putting cow dung into cow horns isn't such a crazy idea after all. Here's the same chart. And as one would expect, the color bars change across the graph. There is even a different configuration of species um, between the inner core and the outer surface of the mature horn manure. The brown bars here and arrows indicate the fungi Ascomycota scutellinea, and A shows their fungal fruiting bodies found on good horn manure, no matter where on the planet it's made. My own research in India indicates that the horns act as a magnet for soil microbiology. Here is mature horn manure. Note the good dark color and structure, as well as the presence of the scutellinea fruiting bodies. Here, we have the horns just lifted after spending five months buried in the soil. You can easily observe an abundance of microorganisms on the exterior surface, notably fungi, the good guys, the ones that sequester carbon. And here is the soil profile from where the horns were lifted. Note how the microorganisms follow the contours of the horns exactly, strongly suggesting that it is the horns themselves that are attracting them there. Same location and circumstances, but this time we're using clay cones as the receptacle for the cow dung. Again, the cones are lifted after five months zero microorganisms visible. And here is the soil profile from which they were taken. Again, zero microorganisms visible, only surrounding roots. 
it's quite clear that the ecosystems around the two receptacles are completely different. Although both were put open-ended in contact with soil at the same location, their contents are the same, i.e. cow dung, and from the same range of cows. We were keen to find out if the receptacle used had any bearing on plant growth. So we matured cow dung in several different receptacles and applied mature substance at monthly intervals. We chose an annual plant, Calendula officinalis, to observe all stages of plant growth from seedling to seed in each, seed, in each season and conducted meticulous double blind observations over a three year period. Photographs of all the sample groups were taken weekly over each growing season. Here, after a single application of the clay cone spray, seedlings are still different sizes and light green in color. Whereas after a single application of real horn manure spray, the seedlings are much bigger, much darker green, and generally more robust. But what is really interesting to me is that they have harmonized in size. It would almost seem as if there was some sort of collaboration and greater coherence between the plants within this particular mini ecosystem. And presumably if the plants are doing better, the soil is also doing better and vice versa. And finally, Alex Podlinski, author, teacher and farmer who su succeeded in taking biodynamic practices to impressive scale, especially in Australia, shows in the main picture, a biodynamic vineyard that has been mechanically weeded and the insert, a conventional vineyard, chemically weeded using glyphosate, but a mere 50 meters away. The stark difference easily visible in the soil quality and health between these two systems, I think speaks for itself. To conclude, for visible differences to be apparent in any of the examples cited, an enormous complexity of living processes and living beings are involved. It would seem in every case that the biodynamic preparations enhance the health, vitality and coherence of all these interactions. Comes about remains a mystery. Bryony, um, we're getting a little bit of crackle from your um, microphone. I think it might just be papers on top of it. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Um, I'd like you to thank you for listening, and I now hand you over to Marina O'Connell. Hello, uh, my name's Marina O'Connell, and I'm um, from the Apricot Centre, Hudson's Cross Farm in Devon, and. Um, Thank you for joining us. I'm going to talk about some um, a different uh, type of science that has explored biodynamic farming for very many years, and they are called the DOP trials. So um, the DOP trials were started in 1978 in Switzerland by the Swiss National Institute of um, Biological Agricultural FIBL in, uh, in Swiss German. And um, this is what they look like. So um, they're randomized plot trials that were used to compare biodynamic, which is the D, which stands for Demeter, the, um, the, um, the symbol for biodynamic farming. O stands for organic, and uh, K stands for conventional or industrial farming systems. So the researchers wanted to compare these three systems of farming and uh, outcomes of these systems of farming in all of their complexity. So what you do in these complex systems is use randomized plot trials to even out the background statistical variables. Um, 
they, uh, the scientists back in um, 1978 decided what to measure and what's key to this bit of research is that they had the foresight not just to measure the yield, which, was, which would have been um, common back there in, in agricultural science, um, but they also monitored the soil processes and the effect of the systems uh, had on the environment around them, or, the, or what we would call nowadays the multiple yields. Um, next slide, Adam. Thank you. Um, so you probably can't read this, but uh, probably in the download, if you wanted to, you could, um, or the references are at the end. But um, they started farming on these plots using the standard methods in biodynamic, organic and conventional systems with, um, with the appropriate rotations, applications of fertilizers and manures. Um, and what they found is after three years that there was uh, a significant difference between the organic, biodynamic and the industrial systems, as we would expect. But they carried on and after 21 years, they found that the biodynamic soils became significantly, statistically significantly different to the organic soils. The biodynamic soils were more biodiverse, they had more earthworms, more beetles, more microbial activity, uh, more microbial mass, more mycorrhiza and uh, which fungi, of course, more weeds and better soil structure. This work was written up and published in Science magazine in 2002 and it was a very famous bit of research. What it proves is quite simply that the biodynamic systems work to, uh, to uh, increase soil biodiversity and, and create more resilient soils. In subsequent years, these trials have gone on to show that biodynamic soils can sequester up to 25% more carbon than organic soils even, and they use 30 to 50% less energy than industrial farming systems per yield of crop. Um, next slide, please, Adam. So what mechanism might we understand um, uh, uh, might bring this, these results about? So as Bryony, the research that Bryony just talked about uh, with the horn manure would suggest a very simple function for these results. So um, um, the, the experiments that Bryony talked about found that the anaerobic fermentation of the manures meant that the horn manure preparation is very high and has very, very high levels of fungi in it. Um, and that those preparations are then stirred for an hour and sprinkled on a regular basis onto the soil in the winter months. And um, potentially they're inoculating the soil with high levels of fungi. Uh, next slide, Adam. So if we, um, if we look at modern uh, up-to-date uh, soil ecology science, what we find is um, that, uh, that that the soil high levels of soil fungi help create something called soil aggregates or mineral associated organic matter. And this is the way in which um, organic matter is actually stuck onto the mineral parts of the soil for the long term. And um, this is the most effective way of sequestering high amounts of carbon from the atmosphere into our soils. So if you put those two little bits of uh, research together, you can understand that that's a, a, a very, a potentially a very good mechanism for these high levels of soil uh, carbon sequestration that we're seeing in uh, biodynamic soils. Um, next slide, Adam, please. Thank you. So on our farm here at Hudson's Cross, it was bought by the BDLT uh, in 2015, and the farm had been industrially farmed as a dairy farm for the previous 40 years. The farm that we took on was uh, a mere 13, it's, it's quite small, it's 13 hectares, and three of those fields were, um, had been in continuous barley uh, um, with, with, with inputs, um, chemical inputs, and there were two fields of wetland meadow, and one field was uh, pasture, and um, the contractor called it a miserable piece of land because they couldn't get anything to grow on it. Um, so because the farm was bought by the Biodynamic Land Trust, the Apricot Centre being the first tenant, um, they asked us to, do, uh, to take some baseline studies so that we could do an impact assessment. And that's what we did. Um, we got a, a, a small grant from the Devon Environmental Foundation, thank you very much, uh, after five years. And uh, in 2020, we did this impact assessment. So what, what we see here, um, that our total carbon emissions were 53 tonnes and, um, and we used 117 
which meant we had we're minus 64. And what that works out per hectare is um, more or less my, minus five tons of carbon per hectare per year. So that means we're carbon negative. And uh, I always like to say carbon negative is positive. It's a good thing. So we're using um, more carbon than we, we're, it's a question more carbon than we use. Um, next slide, please, Adam. So we, um, we use the Farm Carbon Toolkit to, to do this study. And uh, it's very helpful in actually more as a tool in how you can actually farm uh, in a carbon sensitive way. So what we found was from our emissions uh, were mostly in our fuels, um, in our carbon um, debt for the new barn that we built and also in our livestock. So we, we keep chickens, we have 150 chickens for eggs and uh, we, we managed to feed them from 50% from within the farm but we buy in layers pellets, organic layers pellets for the other 50%. Um, now my colleague Dan is going to talk about uh, closed loop small mixed farms in a moment and our aim being biodynamic is to to, to become more of a closed loop system or a farm organism. So we're exploring ways in which we can grow our own uh, chicken food, high protein chicken food in the next couple of years. And we can see um, there by, uh, by doing that, we could reduce our carbon emissions significantly and also obviously switch to a, uh, um, an electric delivery vehicle. Um, next slide, please, Adam. Um, in terms of carbon sequestration, what we can see there is by far the, the, the highest amount of sequestration is in the increase in soil organic matter. Um, we've planted, to put that in context, we've planted 3,000 trees on our small farm in the form of agroforestry, but it is by far the increase in soil organic matter that's, that has sequestered our carbon. And the, the, the methods that we've used on the soil is that to start with, we put deep rooting green manures down. We, um, we applied um, the horn manure uh, two or three times every single winter since we've been here, uh, as well as the other preparations. And on top of that, we use something called a key lime plow, which uh, lets the water out and the air in. So it, it, it breaks, it shatters the compaction at a deep level. So we can, so what I think happened is that we reintroduced the soil biome many, many times every year. And then we fed the soil biome by, by, um, uh, by cutting our deep rooting green manures, topping them off and, uh, and by uh, allowing them to breathe more effectively through the key lime plowing. So next slide, uh, please. Um, I'll, I'll run through these quickly because I'm running short of time. Um, what also we found was, um, so we said put in a rainwater harvest, harvesting system, but through the increase in soil organic matter, uh, we've become more resilient with the, uh, and uh, uh, to water supply. And uh, so we, we can manage now with the rainwater harvesting and we aren't using mains water anymore. Because uh, we're biodynamic, we use CSA methods with, uh, of, of, of crop production. So we grow more than 100 different varieties of crops. And of those crops, they're uh, open pollinated. So things like YQ population wheat, or we buy most of our seeds from biodynamic seed houses, the seed cooperative. And these are extremely resilient uh, seed varieties, but also methods um, or, uh, in the face of climate change that we're now facing in, in, in real time. Next slide, please. In terms of biodiversity, um, as we would expect, our earthworm population has gone through the roof, um, considering we've increased soil organic matter. Um, we've reduced the amount of bare ground significantly, um, and our bird population's um, number of species have gone up by 50%. But also, regularly seeing many other different types of wildlife on the farm um, that we hadn't seen before, like the horseshoe bats and all sorts of rare moths, butterflies, crickets, and um, uh, slow worms. Next, next slide. Um, I'm gonna finish wrap up quite quickly here, but we produce a huge amount of food. Um, that is completely delicious and uh, we're economically viable. If we move on quickly, um, Adam, if next slide. Uh, so we've got a healthy turnover, we're economically viable, and um, we also are home to a, 
uh, wellbeing service on the farm for looked after children. It's funded by the Adoption Support Fund. So next slide, social impact. We carried out a social impact as well on a, uh, with CORE, uh, a Coventry University, and we regularly um, uh, have many, many visitors to the farm. Even in 2020 with lockdown, we had more than a thousand visitors. And um, when we did the survey with CORE, um, so for instance, our customers said that uh, they were more resourceful for food, which meant they ate a broader diet and they felt better for it and they wasted less food, all of which I think we can think are good things. Um, last slide, Adam, in conclusion, the farm's carbon negative and, uh, and, and we've, we've very clearly met the aims uh, uh, of the farm that we laid out clearly when we, when we took it on in 2015. So I shall pass over to my colleague Dan now, who's going to talk about a bit more about these closed loops, these um, mixed, small mixed farms and how effective they are. Thank you. Thanks, Marina. That was an excellent, excellent presentation. Can you see my slides? Yeah, thank you, Adam. So thanks again, Marina, and greetings, everyone. Thanks for joining us in the session. Um, my name is Dan Powell. I work as an advisor to farms, both for the BDA and on an independent basis. My experience and background is, is mainly in mixed pastoral temperate agriculture. So BD biodynamic as a method was initiated nearly 100 years ago and has many crossovers with organics and what many are calling agroecology or regenerative farming today. It typically works from a holistic approach and one of the main barriers to its growth in popularity is that it struggled to find recognition within mainstream scientific research, which in contrast <clears throat> uses reductionist and quantitative methods for measuring results and analysis. So in this session, I really want to summarize available research that's been carried out on biodynamics over the last 70 years or so, and then go on to explain a key concept of biodynamics, which is to view the farm uh, as a living organism. And Marina described that very well in her presentation. This was and is considered to be the cornerstone of a healthy farm system long before the current climate and environmental issues became apparent. From a completely dis different perspective, I want to finish by showing how results from recent scientific work on soil microlife have reached strikingly similar conclusions with, the, with, the, sorry, with respect to healthy land management when considering strategies for carbon positive farming. So let's begin by looking at a selection of reviews of BD research carried out over the years. The body of research is significant, but studying such systems are typically complex and also varied in focus, making it difficult in some cases to replicate the results. Field plots or lab studies give results on parts and particular aspects, but are not always broad enough in scope to look at the whole system, of which biodynamics is really practiced as. So if we look at these three broad reviews, first one by Reginald, um, he looked at a mixture of systems and plot studies. Um, and in particular, he looked at 16 New Zealand farms, uh, which were looked at as system comparisons and he came and his conclusions were similar to what marina has found that was in the bd plots and bd systems there was an increase in soil quality increase in worm populations however this review only only covered english language studies really so there'd be a lot more research to look at this second review by brook brock sorry reviewed work completed between 2006 and 2017. In common, with other, in common with other biological farm systems, biodynamics works on many level. So this review is categorized by theme. Examples are soil quality, uh, viticulture, crops, BD preparations, food quality, and sustainability. If you follow these, if you follow these um, references, you'll be able to look at these research reviews in more detail. Lastly, Turinac covered his review similar in scope to uh, the Brock review, and he looked at yields and soil quality and biodiversity. He did note 
that BD method, the biodynamic method, was still regarded as dogmatic by the general science community, which continues to be skeptical. And that was one of the reasons he undertook his review. Now, there are three um, very good research databases, two of them specifically covering biodynamic research that are listed on the bottom of this slide. The first one is the, um, from the Biodynamic Association in the States. The second one is from the BD Federation in Switzerland. And the third one is a much broader uh, database of organic relevant research, which is uh, managed by ICROFS, which is the International Centre for Research in Organic Food. And you can search those databases by keywords. So if you put in biodynamic to org prints, for example, it will pull out all the research that's, that's been covered and been loaded up into that database. So let's look at the farm organism idea in a little bit more detail. This diagram is based on a real farm in, in the Netherlands and describes the concept well. It seems, it seems complex, but by nature, organisms are complex. The challenge for the farmer is to create diversity while maintaining smooth interdependency between enterprises. The BD farmer aspires to constantly create a network of processes between each aspect they have at their disposal. And examples of these can, be, can come into the farm from either far outside, such as sunlight, for example, or nearer, and oil could come from quite a long way, um, whereas compared to maybe imported manures and straw, which will come from near, nearby. But more importantly, the farm is run as a self-sustaining organism where most of the resources within the farm are drawn upon and enterprises developed in an interdependent way to create surpluses to be sold. The, the organism must never be run in such a way that it's, it's, it's too much for the people and the staff of the farm, as is common in the case. If you over diversify, then the managing element, i.e. the people, will just take, it will just take too much resource. So building and maintaining soil health in this particular system and fertility are indicators of a healthy functioning farm organism. My question then is, can the benefits of the farm organism approach be confirmed by recent research? And what's the significance of the modern carbon and nitrogen question in relation to climate change and greenhouse gases? Now, if any of you attended the, this conference last year, there was a, there was a session with um, Professor Andrew O'Neill, um, where he described his work that he's carried out at Rothamsted. He presented key aspects of his work and in his search for an optimum land practice that's good for carbon capture, Professor Neil correlated specific soil micro -popula microbial populations with different land management approaches. So what did he find? When he compared arable or bare fallow plots with soils under grassland, it was the grassland with farmyard manure inputs which had the highest beneficial microbial soil indicators. Soil pore spaces were higher, and most importantly, contain more oxygen <clears throat> than soil pore spaces on the other plots. Carbon and nitrogen losses were also lowest under grassland. Professor Neil's, Professor Neil's work indicates a mixed farming regime with a grazing livestock presence to produce manure to supply regular inputs of organic matter into the ground in place of synthetic fertilizers is most beneficial for conservation of both carbon and nitrogen two most contentious greenhouse gases. In other words, a mixed farm system or organism is the best way to support a healthy living soil biome. This in turn is most effective in mitigating the effects of carbon and nitrogen losses to the atmosphere. The suggested system is strikingly similar to the ideal biodynamic farm. So I will end with a research question. If the farm organism concept can be shown to be beneficial in this way, as Professor Neil has demonstrated, can similar approaches be applied to biodynamic farm soils to reveal more subtle aspects that could help biodynamic practice become more recognized for the benefits they bring to the land management climate debate? Thanks for your attention. I'll pass over to Richard. Thanks, Dan. And uh, thanks, everyone else. So, welcome to Yatesbury. Transport yourselves for a while into this field of barley on the screen. 
here in southern England. I am Richard Gantlett and I farm at Yatesbury in Wiltshire. I trained as a scientist, an accountant, and I am a biodynamic farmer. What does that make me? Well, a mad doctor perhaps, but I'm passionate about science and biodynamics. Probably not so passionate about the accountancy bit, but I don't want to upset anyone. In the 1990s, I was a conventional arable farmer. And during that time, I could see the quality of our soils deteriorate and the life on the farm vanished before me. It prompted us to set out to regenerate our farm so that we could leave our farm in a better state than we found it. Having read many books and visited many organic farms, we started organic conversion in 1998. But I was looking for something more than organic, something to repair the damage that farming does to soils. Then I met, in 2000, Alex Podlinski, who's already been mentioned, a biodynamic farmer from Australia, whose methods have transformed many farms in many countries. Alex became a good friend, and he inspired me to do my PhD. His method appealed, because as he said, if you cannot show farmers a real transformation of the soil, then how can you convince them to change to biodynamic methods? I'd always been passionate about the soil, and I came to biodynamics because I could see in the farms and the vineyards that I visited with Alex, a real difference, not only in the soil, but in the way the plants grew. Back in the field you're standing in on the screen, and the barley is just ripening. In the center, the pink clover petals and the upper leaves are de uh, demonstrating this biodynamic plant expression that I was just mentioning. So it's this, my hands show the upright vertical form. That's what I'm talking about. But it's a phenomenon one really needs to experience in real life. Our transform transformation focused on improving the soil life by feeding the soil life with diverse plant material, by using the biodynamic preparations, which act like a soil inoculant, and by the positive action of cows, but also by moving away from plowing to light hoeing, cultivation or tillage. This is what we call the Yatesby biodynamic method. This slide depicts the change in our system. On the left is the monocultures that we used to grow. On the right is the diverse mixture of plants that now feed our soil. I like this picture because normally you can't see the soil processes going on beneath the surface. Although learning to perceive these through the processes that uh, and the plant expression is a great skill to learn. On the right, you can see the representation of the rooting activity of our pastures. These pastures we call diverse lays. Diverse because they include at least 33 varieties of 23 species of herbs, grasses, and clovers. What I find interesting is that if you grow these species as monocultures, like on the left-hand side of the picture, then the roots only grow to half of the potential that they achieve in the right-hand picture. So in a mixture, you get twice the rooting depth that you do in monocultures. And that's really quite exciting, I think. So having worked with this system for some years, we've seen the benefits anecdotally. And if you're still standing in the barley field of the previous slide, you'll be feeling the springiness of the soil under your feet and all the rooting, from all the rooting activity. The skylarks overhead and the annoying insects buzzing around your ears. These quotations are from visitors to our farm, which demonstrate these anecdotal benefits. Turning to the science, our system returns the barley straw and the pasture plants back to the soil to feed the soil life. Whereas most farms, and do we, used to sell that material for extra income. So I decided to do an experiment to look at the impact or the value of this 
feeding the soil life with these crop residues. And this experiment was the basis of my PhD research. So in regenerating the farm, we didn't set out to store carbon, but my research showed that enhancing soil life in our farming system does store a lot of carbon through increasing soil organic matter. Something I couldn't shout about if we hadn't done the research using the scientific method. We proved that we store soil carbon two to three times faster than global targets. These targets have been shown to be difficult to achieve, so this really is exciting. Importantly, we discovered that it is the diverse rooting activity that I talked about on the previous slide that is responsible for the storing of the carbon, rather than the retention of the straw or the crop residues. And that really was a surprise. I hope this has given you a flavor of what we're doing. I've had to skip over much of the science and the biodynamics practice, but please do visit our website and Instagram feed to find out more about us. Well, come and visit, you're very welcome. So if you want to have a world where everyone eats sufficient, healthy food, food grown in pollution-free soil, teeming with fungi, mesofauna and earthworms that you've been hearing about, food from plants flourishing in fields, shared with nature, with insects, plant, uh, birds and wildflowers, food from vibrant farms employing content and happy farmers who value all life and are truly valued by society. And I think that's why we're all at this conference. Well, we can have a future like this and biodynamic farming can make a huge contribution. We just need a new vision. So I look forward to hearing what you will do and I wish you all well in repairing and enhancing your patch of soil. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That's a very clarion call to action. Um, thank you to all the, the, the speakers. I just wonder if I am an organic farmer, where do I start on the biodynamic road? Um, if I could throw the question back to you, Richard, where would you suggest I take up the, the mantle of your charge? Uh there are various books written by Alex uh, that uh, have been alluded to, so that would be a good place, but really to go and visit biodynamic farms. There are excellent biodynamic farms around the country and around the world, um, in France and Italy, I know many, and in Germany, uh, in um, uh, Slovenia, Slovakia, uh, and all around Australia, I mean, in India. You know, I think we all probably know farmers around the world who are farming biodynamically. Uh, hopefully our audience is, is uh, not just from the UK, I'm sure it, it, it's, it's global. Right. Uh, I know uh, biodynamic farmers are only too welcoming to, to people wanting to learn uh, uh, biodynamic te techniques, so I, I, I uh, encourage you to, to get in touch with a biodynamic farmer. So a bit sceptical. How do you, how would you, Dan, um, suggest that somebody with a little bit more scepticism standing across you, how would you suggest that they go or treat this, the scepticism? It sounds a little bit like magic. <laughs> well, that's a good question. I think um, if you go and visit biodynamic farms, as Richard suggested, you will find a commonality and that commonality will generally be the farmers themselves, their families or the people who work on the place. And I think those people um, will tend to explain to you the best reasons um, why there isn't, you don't need to be skeptic because ultimately farming in any form is about people. It's about growing food for people and the animals that support those farm systems. And the people need to be happy growing the food. Um, Otherwise, there's something tainted in the food. And, that, and I think that biodynamic farms almost exclusively, even though people are not always getting it perfectly right, they tend to be, um, they feel like they're happy in their work. I don't know if others have similar experience. 
Could I, Adam? Could I add to that uh, to the to the answer? Having having um, taught biodynamic gardening mostly um, uh, in in mainstream colleges and in in the mainstream for many years, I've introduced biodynamics as a system to many people. And um, one of the main practices, if you like, that is different to organic farming is the use of these preparations. So what I normally ask people to do is to um, uh, suspend their judgment for a moment or scepticism, you might say, and just give it a go as an, exper as an experience, in an experiential way. And when people do that, I find that they um, normally have a big smile on their face and they enjoy the process. Uh, it's, it's, um, it, it's quite often a, a, a rational thing that I think we find difficult in our Western mindsets in countries like India, where, the, you know, the spirit and farming and soil is naturally part of the cultural um, norm, like in China, then it, 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 people don't have that barrier. And um, uh, so that's, that's what I ask people to do who are feeling skeptical is give it, you know, just experience it but also obviously eating the food or drinking the wine is the other way to get over those barriers quite quickly <laughs> could i pick up the, the the words india and and go to Bryony? there's a very specific question in the chat um raised about whether or not in preparing the preparations white spots microbes similar to the ones that you showed on the photos are they the good guys are they the ones the that um Angela is, is looking to cultivate? Um, I, I think so, Adam. I mean, obviously it's, it's difficult to know what other people are experiencing, but, um, you know, as I said in my presentation, um, biodynamic farmers all over the globe um, tend to find these, these white spots and tend to see it as an indication that it's, it's good mature horn manure and certainly um, my my colleagues who who work in New Zealand in India in Latvia in Israel um, all report seeing the, the the this 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 the kind of same observable features and um, you know, the, the proof of the pudding is always in, in the experience of it. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's always necessary to um, delineate exactly what, what's in it, but if it works, um, you know, that, that means that it's good. And, um, you know, also we, um, the conference has talked a lot about diversity. So um, one shouldn't be too, as long as one has done things in the right manner and with the right spirit, um, you know, the, the good guys will see off the bad guys. Brilliant. Can I pick up a question from the Q&A? spirits um how important relevant would you say the esoteric aspects of biodynamic farming are today especially in relation to permaculture uh, agroecological versus conventional farming especially if we're thinking about introducing these to more farmers so how important is the spiritual cosmic esoteric element can i throw the question open and see who would like to answer <laughs> Um, Steiner, um, there's, there's a verse, um, that is read out, um, in, at the beginning of the day, um, in the courses that I facilitate in India. And part of the verse says that, um, uh, spirit is never without matter and matter is never without spirit. And I don't think this is such a difficult concept um, to, to get across. If you think that, um, I mean, as farmers, we tend to talk an awful lot about the soil. 
um, which of course is the solid substance that we, we stand on. But we very seldom actually talk about non-substance. And if we consider that through the, the, the process of photosynthesis is basically about turning non-substance, light and warmth from the sun into substance um, via photosynthesis, i.e. light and warmth turns into a plant, I think we can begin to see how it's not just about substance. There's something more um, at work here. Thank you, Marina. I, I was going to pick up the point about the permaculture and the biodynamics because, um, um, because I practice both and uh, quite often they inhabit separate silos. And I guess it's my, um, uh, offer uh, is, is actually they, they work incredibly well together um, in my experience because one is a design process and the other one is more of a farming method and um, I did a quite interesting exercise a while ago where I took the permaculture principles and the biodynamic principles and although they use different language they are identical the, um, the only difference is that the biodynamic principles include a connection to the cosmic uh, rhythms and uh, biodynamic principles don't, but um, they're remarkably similar, but they use different language. Um, I, I don't know if the question was alluding to whether you need to be an anthroposophist um, to be a biodynamic farmer, in that that is a, that is a, um, that's, that sits within the, the, um, the um, within the same sort of uh, Steiner obviously um, developed the, the philosophy of anthroposophy and also biodynamics, but uh, my understanding is that they, you can be a biodynamic farmer without being an anthroposophist, and Steiner wrote about that at the end of his eight lectures. So I don't know if that clarifies that. Lots at all. of panellists nodding at the moment. Mm. Could, could I pick, thank you, could I ask a question again open to the panel from Elizabeth, who's um, asking if there's any research that's been looking into the nutritional profile of biodynamic fruit and veg and grains, and even or even the taste uh, um, in comparison to other. Is, can I ask if any of the panelists would like to pick this one up? I don't know, if Richard. Um, if you, oh, I, sorry, Richard, if you'd like to go ahead. Okay. Um, I was very interested in Nicolette Han Neiman's um, very interesting talk. Um, and she um, quoted a reference saying that um, flavor is, is very indicative of nutrient density. And um, it's very interesting that biodynamics is um, gaining the most traction in the wine and coffee industries where people are prepared to pay a premium um, for flavor, but not only flavor, but aroma and, and um, you know, other um, aroma, color, and um, all of the, the factors that affect our senses and our enjoyment. Um, so this would indicate certainly that the, the nutrient um, density in biodynamic produce is, um, is favorable. Um, it's just unfortunate that people don't pay a premium for a cabbage or a carrot, but if we do value um, flavor and equate that to nutrient density, then biodynamics um, indicates that it has a positive influence in that in that sphere. Thank you. I see we're, we're up against the clock a little bit. I'm trying to get through the, the other questions. Um, I'd like to give the next question to Richard and Marina. It's a question about how did you choose which aspects of biodynamic farming to incorporate into your complex system of different land, uh, land techniques? It's desperately interesting question. You've only got a short time to answer it. Marina or Richard? Uh, Richard, if you go, you go first. <laughs> okay. 
Um, um, all, I think. Uh, I, I'm not sure we exclude any of the biodynamic aspects. We, we have a system that includes many different uh, principles, and uh, um, I'm, I'm curious about what, what might be excluded. So you have cattle on your land as well? Yes. Is there a maximum limit of size to a farm that can be managed biodynamically? Uh, that that's within the capacity of the um, the organizer, the orchestrator, the conductor, if you like, who's looking after the the, the farm organism, um, much as in the same way as a, a, an orchestra um, is managed by the the conductor. And yeah, it's within the capacity of the of the person who who's doing that. So it's the okay, Marina. Thank you. Um, so, so there is the, the Demeter standards that uh, if, you, if you want to be registered biodynamic, the Demeter standards set out what practices you need to do as a minimum. Um, so I just would like to say that, of course, we, uh, we, so we, do, we do do those. So what we do is we put the preparations on um, and we do those preparations in accordance with the biodynamic calendar. We don't use the calendar for our day-to-day -day operations on the farm because it's it's just too complicated. Um, and I think what you have to um, uh, remember is that we're also a new farm. And as you become more established, some of these practices become more easy um, to, to implement. Um, so it, it's actually not as complicated as perhaps it sounds. Um, and I, I, I enjoy the um, the the moment it um the the day we take breath when we put the put the preps on it gives you a different flavor of a day and it gives you time to go around all the corners of the farm um and so it's it's in fact not as complex perhaps as 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 the question might suggest okay i agree with that i think exactly <laughs> that's probably why i'm confused about the question because i think it's you know, it, it just fits so well into to how we farm and um, and you can add as you go along exactly as you learn more about uh, how to connect better with nature, then you just add that into your system and the way you work. Thank you. One minute to go. I'd like to spend the last minute thanking the panelists and also everybody for attending. Um, it's been a very interesting hour. Uh, if you would like more information about biodynamics, or the presentations that we've had today, please contact us via our website. We also have Dan from Farm Services who can help with those practical first steps, or as you've heard, any of the biodynamic farmers are genuinely really welcoming people and will help um, anybody along the course.